We are pleased uh, that you've joined uh, us for developing people with A3 thinking. Before we uh, get started, uh, normal housekeeping rules, please turn off the sound of your uh, Blackberries phones, please. <clears throat> Our speaker this afternoon is Jamie Flinchbaugh. Jamie is a founder and partner of Lean Learning Center based in Novi, Michigan, and the co-author of the Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to Lean, Lessons from the Road. He shares his successful and varied experiences of lean transformation as a practitioner and leader through companies such as Chrysler and DTE Energy. He also has a wide range of practical experience in industrial operations, including production, maintenance, material control, product development, and manufacturing engineering. Flinchbaugh is a graduate fellow of the highly regarded Leaders for Manufacturing program at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where his research thesis was on implementing lean manufacturing through factory design. He also holds a bachelor's in engineering from Lehigh University in Pennsylvania and a master's in engineering from the University of Michigan. In 2006, he was named to Craig's uh, Detroit's 40 under 40 list for his accomplishments. Please help me welcome Mr. Jamie Flinchball for this afternoon. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying the conference so far. I've uh, um, Heard a lot of interesting presentations myself, uh, starting with John, John Shook this morning, just to get us, get us all started. Um, I want to start with a, a little bit of a story, just kind of sets my frame of reference around the topic for this afternoon. Um, when I, I, I didn't have a, a, a normal childhood, is I, I quite literally grew up in a machine tool company, a company called Weldon, and we made, we made grinders, uh, first CNC grinder in the world. And I started on the shop floor when I was 10, shoveling machine chips. So that was my, that was my job, was to you know, clean up the mess left by all the machine tools. And I did various jobs from writing machine code, uh, uh, running machine tools, you know, doing all sorts of odd jobs around the shop uh, through, throughout the years. Uh, I took on a project uh, while I was still there, um, uh, while I was in, I believe, high school. And the project was to write some machine code for a, a client that was buying a machine tool. And they had a problem where they were doing prototyping. And every time they do a new prototype, they get a new engineering drawing, and they'd send it to the engineers. And six weeks later, they'd get it down to the, machine, to the floor where they could actually machine the part. So what I started uh, to do a project on, not really knowing any better, was to figure out how can we automate that process? How can I put some code together so you can just punch in the numbers and speed it along so instead of six weeks, it would take less time? Now, when I started looking at that, I didn't have any assumptions about how they did it. I, I didn't have the experience to have all those assumptions, so I suspended all of them. All those assumptions went aside. And I, I started looking at the project and the problem with a fresh lens. As I did that, I started writing some, some code and, and put together a, a program where the operator on the shop floor could get the same drawing that the engineer got and basically read a few lines punch the numbers into the computer, and six minutes later, uh, they'd get the machine code that they needed. So we basically took what took six weeks, mostly of wait time, skipped over the engineers entirely, jumped straight to the shop floor, and it took six minutes. Now, it was no brilliant amount of coding that got, got us to that point. But what it said for me very early, and, and, and I think is really the heart of this topic, is all I did was look at the problem with a fresh set of eyes. I looked at what was really going on. I forgot all the assumptions that every other person that looked at that problem was, was using. And I just looked at it with a new lens. And as I did that, I came up with a, a, a solution that was infinitely better. But it wasn't that I was a great engineer. I'm actually now a recovering engineer. So uh, um, never was a great engineer, but I, 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 I paid a few dues. Um, but it was just because I looked at a problem in, in a new light. And at the end, that's really what we're going to be talking about with A3 problem solving, is it's how do we look at things from a new lens, from a new perspective, from a, a new way of thinking, and get often fundamentally different answers. Now, I'm going to contradict myself right off the bat, because what I'm going to tell you is that you know, my title says developing people with A3 thinking. So the first part, absolutely agree with. We, we are all about developing people. That's one of the key things that we're trying to accomplish here. 
But I'm actually going to tell you that there is no such thing as A3 thinking. Um, now, uh, in, in reference to my friends, uh, uh, Derwood Sobeck and Art Smalley, who wrote a book, A3 A Thinking, um, and, and uh, John Shook, who wrote a book about A3 thinking, um, what, what I really mean to say is that A3 is just a tool. It's lean thinking that we really have to apply. And that, that lean thinking goes with us every day, and we either develop that thinking and apply it, or we don't. And that's really what we're after. There's no magic in A3. All it is is a tool. You pick up that tool, and you use it, and you're not going to get a fundamentally different result. What's going to give you a different result is the thinking that you use. So A3 is simply a tool that helps us apply that thinking. That's what it really accomplishes. And so that's what we're really going to be, going to be talking about. So uh, a real quick agenda. I must have pushed the wrong button there. There we go. So just a little bit of background about why we even talk about this. Kind of spent a little bit of time going through the tool itself and just some, some tips and techniques for how you think about using it. Um, plenty of books out there. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, assume that some of you have never heard of it. So for the record, how many of you have never heard of A3 thinking? Okay, there you go. And how many of you have been using it for a while? Okay, so, and everyone else is somewhere in between there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure, we're not going to go all the way back to square one, but I'll make sure you at least understand kind of where, where we're coming from. And really spend some time about how to use it for developing people. So how do we use this to get the thinking built in the organization? How do we use it to coach? How do we use it to get the right thinking? And lastly, a bit of call to action, because after all, if we don't act, then what's the point of being here? Uh, only reason for being here, I'll, I'll say this now, is uh, uh, you, you learn for the point of purpose of action. So if you don't go back, if you don't go back uh, uh, next week or later this week and take action on what you've learned this week, then this week was a waste. That's just by definition. So a lot of you have done lean. You know what lean is. Lean value add has to transform something. If you don't take action with what you've learned, the week was a waste. So don't make it a waste. Take action on what you've learned. So a little bit about what A3s are about, and I'll kind of show you some examples of what this really means. Uh, first is, you know, where does A3 come from? Well, you know, for, for a lot of you, you're very familiar with what A3 means. It's just an international standard for a certain paper size. For, for those of you that are, you know, U.S.-based, we like to do everything differently, so we're kind of pretty much the only ones that don't use, use that standard. But it's just a, a size of paper that's about 11 by 17. Now, so what's, what's, what's special about that? Well, what we're really saying is that all those pr presentations, all those 50 pages of PowerPoint, all those 40-page Word documents, all those things that we spend hours and hours, we want to get it down to one page. So what we're really saying is waste-free report writing. And that's what it's about. It's about it, all it is is report writing. It's about getting it down to one page. Now, there's no magic in the one page. Again, it's about the thinking that we capture in that. And we can't capture everything. But it's standardized and it's simplified. That's, that's the keys. And I'm, I'm going to talk about each of those points. The simplified is let's spend a little less time generating PowerPoint. So I you know, regret to inform you I'll be using PowerPoint to talk about why we shouldn't use PowerPoint. But <laughs> we need to cut back on the amount of PowerPoint we, we should use. And I'll, I'll share a little bit of that. But the standardization, it's always the same. We can look at it and we know what we're going to see. That's equally important. Um, it's also really a method for thinking through. So when people say A3 thinking, it's really a method for how we think through a problem. So from beginning to end, from problem definition to, to solution, how do we really think through a problem? And so that, that'll be what we spend the last part of the time on, is what is some of that thinking? Now, a couple things that I should say it's not, because there's a lot of uh, misuse, just like any tool that comes out. We misuse it as, well as, we, as often as we use it well. So first of all is that there's no one standard A3 format. There's no magic formula. Toyota has many. Uh, if you want to use them as a standard, if you want to use yourself for the standard, it doesn't matter because there's not one format that says, here's what an A3 is. It should look like this. It should always look like that. Anything that doesn't look like this is just plain wrong. That's not true. Now, th the danger in this is I actually saw one company spend six months arguing, debating, dialoguing, iterating off what their form was going to be. Now, that was six months of waste, I can tell you very clearly. So... It's not the form. We'll give you a kind of a basic structure to be thinking through. Don't spend too much time on the form. You'll just simply be wasting your time. Um, and, and ultimately, it's really not about the piece of paper. Um, you know, when somebody says, here's my A3, 
This is like saying, you know, if I, somebody shows up and they bring you up to their wall and they have Gantt charts and all sorts of flow charts and says, here's my project. That's not your project. Your project is all the work that people do. That's just, that little chart on the wall is just a manifestation. That's, that's all that is. It's just a representation of what that is. Your A3 report, when you bring an A3 to someone and says, here's my problem. That's not your problem. It's just how you've written down your problem. That's all it is. So it's just a piece of paper. We shouldn't put any more weight into it than that. Now, the reason I say simplified and standardized report writing is that we spend a lot of time in organizations really churning lots of calories and energy around generating reports and reviewing reports and not really being clear about what value we're really trying to get out of that. Now, just as a, an example of uh, how, how badly I saw the problem early on is when I, when I was at DT Energy, we had a, a team of continuous improvement people that we were building, and I asked each one of them to come with a presentation of their problem, the project that they were working on, and kind of review progress and results and how they were doing. And one of them, I can remember her, her presentation well, there were 27 pages. She was working with one particular department, 27 pages of PowerPoint on the history of that department. So these were photographs and organizational charts and when it got started and how many orders they process and 27 PowerPoint pages on the history of the department and two on the actions that they took. Now, that wasn't what we wanted. So it really brings me to the point around standardized. Now, that wasn't really her fault. That was my fault. Because we didn't have a standard way to report the projects. So she went off and she generated all sorts of mental calories trying to figure out what should I put together in this PowerPoint presentation. And she put, she was just one person, every single one of them independently put hours and hours. There's no reason we should waste time reinventing the report. Right? We should standardize it so we have a format and we know what we're really working through. So we want to make sure we're not wasting our energy generating reports, reviewing reports, and, uh, and, and having those conversations. Now, backwards here. And when I say it's really about the thinking, and we're trying to develop A3 thinking, that's really what A3, Lean is about. It's about the thinking. Lean is not about a bunch of tools. I'll just kind of give you a, a, a simple example of this. Uh, how many of you know what an, what an Andon system is? Okay, so many of you do. So you know, when, I, when, when I was at Chrysler, you know, we... we tried to copy all kinds of things from, uh, from Toyota, uh, one of which was the Endine Corps. We go down and visit, visit, go over to Japan, visit the factories and see how they're doing things. And Endine Corps is pretty neat. You know, you know, somebody has a problem, they pull this cord. Uh, people come running over, they say, how can I help? They solve a problem and boom, they're on to the next thing. I think, oh, that's just cool. You know, lights go off, music goes off. So we, th we need that. Now, let's, let's put that in our factories. So, you know, we get out, being good engineers, we measure how high to make the cord, how long to make it, what music to play, what color the light should be. And we pick that system up and stick it into our factory. And then we turn it on. And the first team member pulls the end on cord. Supervisor walks over and says, what do you want now? And, you know, that was not exactly the response that we saw at Toyota. He saw a very different response, which was, you know, you're stopping my line. How dare you stop my line? What problem could you possibly have that needs my attention? Well, you can bet, if that happens to you, do you pull the end on court again? Absolutely not, right? We don't need that kind of punishment. So, we don't. And that system fell apart. Well, we thought, you know, we'll just go back, we'll get more tools and get, you know, be more efficient, get two tools per trip. And we just keep piling tools onto the system, thinking if we get enough tools going, will really be a lean organization. But tools do not make us lean. I've never seen an organization fail because they didn't have the right continuous improvement tool. I've never seen that happen. I have seen lots of organizations fail because they didn't have the right thinking in place. Now, I'll spend a time a little later talking about some examples of what this thinking looks like, but just, just to kind of make, make the point is, you know, lots of organizations uh, develop thinking for the organization. Sometimes we develop it by, by accident. Well, just based on the collective behaviors of management and leadership. And sometimes we really make explicit efforts to say, here's the culture and the things we're trying to develop. But the point is, is that how we think really drives our behaviors. And I'll kind of come back to that. But the reason that thinking matters so much, and we're, this is about workforce development, so let's, let's kind of talk about that as, as we go. When we talk about lean, one of my the most common questions I get today, particularly as more larger organizations have really started doing lean, is how do you measure the success of lean? 
Everybody wants to, how do you measure it? Well, I can tell you how you don't measure it. You don't measure the number of Kaizen events you have or the number of people you trained. Uh, those are the easy things to measure. To me, the, the best measure, now let me say measure very carefully. This is not a metric, so don't try to you know, calculate it and roll it up into some big cor corporate score, scoreboard. This is just an, an indicator. But the best measure of sustainable success is the percentage of work that leaders change of their own work. So take any leader. I don't care what position they're on the organization. How much are they practicing continuous improvement on their own job? You know, 20, does 20% 20 of their work every quarter change? Does 50% of their work every quarter change? Because if the leader truly is embedded lean thinking principles, if they think lean, they can't help but to apply it to their own job. That's the true measure of whether they really get it. And if that leader really gets it, they're going to do all the right things to make sure the rest of the organization is moving along in the same direction. So that, to me, is the best indicator is, am I, as a leader, applying lean to my own job? Am I changing what I spend time on? Am I changing how I do it? And if I'm doing that, then I've probably gotten a good taste of what lean principles really mean. So that's the best metric, but uh, at least from my standpoint, again, not a corporate metric, just an indicator, kind of tells you whether things are headed in the right direction. So let me kind of cover... Now, so a little background there, but let me kind of go through the tool. I know we have a lot of people that haven't, haven't used this before, so let me just kind of cover the basics and set a little tone for, for how this works. Here's what most presentations look like. Now, usually not in one slide, but we cover what's the problem and what's the solution. And so we can, we can generate 50 pages of PowerPoint on those two things alone. It's not about just about the quantity, but that's the topics that we cover. What's the problem and what's the solution? Now, there's only one thing worse than that. And that's what we actually often do is the other way around, is we have a solution and we go looking for the problem. That's how a lot of things get developed. Um, now, most of those aren't very successful. I saw one company that was uh, out, uh, they had developed software. It tends to happen uh, quite often in software development, I think. But they developed some software that they thought was just God's gift to software developers. And they, you know, they, was very, they were very excited about this. And they brought it to market and they met with all these companies and they they sat down with them and they said, well, what problem does this help me with? Well, I, I don't know, but isn't it really cool? Well, yeah, it is really cool, but it doesn't help me solve a problem. So we certainly don't want this. And just as much as we don't want that, we don't want just a problem and just the solution. What we really want to capture is the full thinking that got us from point A to point B. So here's your, your fundamental flow chart for what an A3 looks like. Yes, we need the problem statement. What is the problem? And I'll talk about what that looks like, because just saying we have a problem statement is not guarantee success. But we also need to really spend time on the current condition. What is the current condition? What is current reality? What is actually going on? So John Shook talked about this around going to see, going to understand, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But we need to understand what that current condition is. And we have to develop a target condition. What do we want it to look like later? Now, once we're done all this work, what are we heading towards? Then and only then should we start to communicate, here's my solution, here's the steps, here's the actions, here's the schedule, here's the metrics, here's what the work is going to be. Now, when I see a whole bunch of people sitting in a conference room arguing for three hours about whether solution A or solution B is the right solution, they aren't actually arguing about the solution. If you followed one person's train of thought, they have a very logical solution for their plat problem. And the other person has a very logical solution for their train of thought. What we're really arguing about is the assumptions that underlie that solution. We're arguing about the current condition, what you assume it is versus what I assume it is. And we're arguing about the target condition. Where am I trying to take the organization versus where are you trying to take the organization? That's the heart of the argument. Yet, if we don't communicate that, we can never resolve the gap we have between those two people or those two departments or those... Uh, 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 two executives, whoever it might be. So the point of this is that we need to communicate the full thinking that got us from point A to point B. Now, there's many benefits when we communicate the full thinking. First is people simply understand how you got there. So if there's an assumption that you've made that they disagree with, well, let's challenge that assumption. Let's not just challenge the end result. Let's challenge the exact assumption that you have that's different than what I have. But secondly, and this goes back to the developing people part, is it's really hard to coach someone how to think better if I can't see their thinking. That's really hard. All I can do is coach them whether they got the right answer or not. Nope, sorry, the right answer was C. You fail. 
It's not very good coaching, is it? So unless I can see what thinking people were using to get from point A to point B, there's no way that's going, I'm going to be successful in coaching them to think differently. So if we want to develop our organization, we want to develop the thinking in the organization, if I can't see the thinking, I can't coach the thinking. So a big benefit of this from a workforce development, from a people development standpoint, is getting the thinking visible so we can actually see what's going on. So in the heart of these steps, just to kind of clarify, I'll give you just a couple examples. Well, these are just some, some points. So the point is that this should flow and be simple. And it's, you know, once we have it structured, we can communicate and we can coach. So those are the, the benefits that come out of it. So just to, just to share a little bit around, these are just some examples. There's no special examples, but it just gives me something else to show you while I'll make a few points around the structure. Um, first is, why does this format matter? First is that, you know, it's a standard structure. Every time someone puts an A3 in front of me, I'm going to know what I'm looking at. I'm going to know how they got from point A to point B. I can sit down and read it because it's the same format that the other guy uses. It's the same format that I use. Because we have a standardized format, I can follow very easily. Now, I'll share with you, um, do a lot of executive coaching, do a lot of assessments, and so that's in one organization. I spent time in different meetings, operations reviews, and, and so forth. And every meeting I went to, I saw someone else working on a PowerPoint that wasn't clearly about that meeting. Um, now, then later on that afternoon, I found out where all those PowerPoints were headed. So there was a weekly operations meeting. And during every other meeting, when people were, should have been paying attention, they were actually working on their PowerPoint for the ass afternoons meeting. So why have meetings if all you're going to do is work on your PowerPoint in the meeting? But that was a whole other coaching point. Now, in this presentation, we saw people come up with presentations, and, and Jenny, who happened to be the factory manager, every presentation, every page, she'd ask, well, what about this? What about that? You know, have you assumed this? And every time she'd ask a question, they'd say, yep, just hold on, we're getting to that in the next slide. Every time she asked a question, they were already ahead, but she had to interrupt them because she was waiting to see it. Now, when we had a conversation about this afterwards, we talked about their use of A3s, and she says, well, when I see an A3, I relax because I know when I'm going to get what. So I don't have to jump around, worry about what I'm missing, worry about your train of thought, worry about how to get from point A to point B because I know when to ask what questions. So for her as a factory manager, it became dramatically more effective for her when she saw an A3 because she knew what to pay attention to, when to pay attention to it, and when to ask what questions. Every time she had something other than that, she was all worried about what she was, what she was missing, what she should be asking, what wasn't fitting, how did it flow. She spent all her time on that. And no one walked away happy from those meetings. So the value of the standard format is everybody knows how to follow the thinking from one point to the next. Now, here's just a, another example. Now, this isn't... A, it's just a template, but this is actually what we use for, for planning Kaizen events, is we use, use an A3 format for that. You know, what's the, what's the, uh, the problem statement? What's the current reality? What's the ideal state? And what, what actions come out of that Kaizen? It was a pretty powerful tool for, for planning and communicating the Kaizen event. But the point is you can develop an A3 for just about any purpose. You know, you have to develop a status meeting? Oh, fine, we'll have an A3 for that. You need to develop a problem statement? Fine, we'll have an A3 for that. Need to plan a Kaizen event. Sure, we can have an A3 for that. But the point is it always follows the same thinking. Problem, current reality, target condition, and the actions to close that gap. Always follows that same thinking, and then everyone knows what they're looking at when they follow that. So, again, don't put too much thought into the format. Um, you know, if, if one person uses one that's slightly different than the next, as long as you always follow the same base format, it'll be easy for everyone to follow along. So here's simply another one that I uh, actually show, show you for a couple reasons. I'm sure you can't read that even on this screen. Um, this is uh, only slightly better than my penmanship. Um, but I show you this for a reason. is It's actually one of the best A3s I've ever coached. Not because it looks good, but because the thinking behind it was really, really solid. Now, a couple of points around this. One is it really doesn't matter what it looks like. Again, it's not the piece of paper that matters. A piece of paper is just a communication tool. What matters is the thinking that goes along the process. Now, why this, the thinking was so sound in this is this particular A3 took about three, four months. Because it's not just do a bunch of work 
And then later, the boss man wants to hear what you did, so you try to write it down in a report. That's what, what A3s are for. A3s are for helping you along the way. Communicate, collaborate, get coaching, and give coaching. That's what it's for. So I should start one. I should start filling it up. I should start writing stuff down. I should use that to collaborate and co have conversations with other people and get their input. Now, the other reason I like this is the pictures. You know, you, you probably can't read a lot of those words. I can't even read a lot of those words. But the pictures tell an awful big story. I still need some of the words to make sense of it. But the point is, is that we should almost always use pictures. Pictures are truly worth a thousand words. And there's two benefits to this. First is that, you know, if I do this, I'll say use a pencil. I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second. But if I, if I start to use a computer, all I'm encouraged to do is say, oh, it's a one-page report. I got it. Six-point font. No problem. One page. Oh, and by the way, I have a lot of hidden text, which I can pop up in case it's not enough. Um, so I can, you know, there's lots of ways to get it down to one page. If I take it off the computer, if I actually sit down and start to write stuff out, first of all, it, it does focus me on the problem itself and not just squeezing stuff in. But secondly, when I draw a picture, I'm much better at thinking at a systems level. And that, in the end, is what Lean is, you know, not all about, but largely about, is let's get past the symptoms, let's get past the firefighting, let's get down to understand the system underneath all those events, underneath all of those results. Let's understand how the work is designed, how the processes work, and how those processes generate the results that we get. Now, when I draw a picture, it's a lot harder, a lot easier to draw a picture of a system than just the results. When I just use words, I tend to write down the results and not the system. So I'll say it this way, is that when we draw a picture, it helps us focus on the right part of attention. It helps us focus on the system how the work and how the process is giving us the results that we want. So that's really why I encourage you to do it this way. Draw a picture. Uh, use a pencil. Uh, there's something more to that as well. So a couple just tips and techniques. Uh, in addition to why using the pencil is that I can guarantee you some of your work will be wrong. If it isn't, then you either pick too easy a problem or you weren't honest with yourself. Almost always, and I, I've, done, I've done lots and lots of A3s over the last 10 or 15 years, and I don't think I've ever not pulled out my eraser. Every time there's going to be revisions. We're going to learn along the way. And so I, I mean pencil figuratively and literally. You know, it's also easy to erase things on a computer. Understand. Um, just hit the backspace key. Uh, but the point is, is that we really should be thinking about this as an active document, something that we're going to change, we're going to modify as we learn something, we, we go to the next step and the next step and the next step. Talk about more of that in the, the problem statement. Again, just as my last example show you, function over form. It's not about having a pretty A3. It's not about having a bunch of clip art. It's not about having you know, it all look nice and neat. It's really about the thinking that went into the problem you're trying to solve. That's what matters. Again, somebody holds up the A3, here's my problem. That's not your problem. That's just what you wrote down about your problem. That's all it is. Your real problem exists out there in the work. Your real problem exists out there in the organization. That's the real work. A3 is just a way to capture it. Um, making them visible, and let me actually kind of show you this as, a, as an example, is get, A3s do not belong in a laptop. Don't get them off. I mean, if you put them on a laptop because you want to write it on a laptop, fine. If you want to save a copy of your laptop, fine. That's not where you should keep them. Get them up on a wall. If it's a team area, get them up on your team area's wall for their A3s. If it's, if it's yours, get them up on your cubicle wall. I mean, put them, put them up there. Put them on your door. Put them on your window. Put them somewhere for many different reasons. One is it's really easy to forget about them uh, if, I, if I don't have them visible. Second, more importantly is that other people can inquire, can coach, can offer input into the problem I'm working on if they can see it. And third, and perhaps most importantly, is wouldn't it be nice to know what your boss's most important problems are at this point in time? You know, tell me one employee that would not benefit from knowing what their boss's most important problems really are at that point in time. It's really easy to find out. Go look at what A3s they're working on. 
You know, if I can, if I can take, take a factory management team, and I get that staff together, and we have a bunch of projects we're working on, and I put it up on a wall where everybody can see it, think about how much the organization will learn just around what's important and what we're doing about it. That's a whole lot more information than they got. Well, Joe came down and asked me about such and such a product, so what do you think's going on there? That's how most people find out about what management finds important. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could share it with them all the time? So A3 is a visual tool. Make it visual. Get it off the laptop. Get it up on a wall. Get it where people can see it. Carry it around with you. Do anything you can to get more input and more visibility. So back to oops, go backwards. Back to uh, some of these points is collaborate. Um, this is problem solving and improvement is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. So collaborate means do it along the way. If you write down a problem statement, get input. If you write down a current condition, get feedback. If you develop a target condition, get buy-in. This is something that should take, go slow to go fast. You might spend three months working on an A3, but if you do it right and you have the right collaboration and input, then the implementation is going to be a whole lot better. So one of the, one of the most disturbing problems that I see in organizations is when the organization develops a great solution. And over here, Bob's team has implemented the great solution. And everyone else would benefit from this team's great solution. Yet, no one has implemented it. Now, this isn't a problem of innovation, of imagination, of creativity. This is just a problem of getting over the not invented here and getting it implemented across the organization. So, as an idea of how, how important this problem is, this not invented here problem, is... Um, I had one, uh, one executive who uh, would go around from site to site doing, doing his own coaching. And one of his favorite questions is he, he would ask somebody about the improvements they're working on. And as they would see an improvement, they'd say, well, I've done this, and it saved us 20% or you know, reduced scrap by 80%, whatever it is, it's a really nice improvement. And so he would ask, well, where else in the organization would that benefit? Well, it would benefit them over there, and them over there, and them over there. He'd say, well, have you... Have you taken it there. Have you implemented in these other departments? Well, no. They're not my departments. He said, okay, on a scale of 1 to 100, you get a 10. Now, I don't know why I just didn't say 1 out of 10, but I guess it's more dramatic if you get a 10 out of 100. So, out of 100, you get a 10. Now, when you get it implemented in all those other departments, when you get the buy-in, when you get that idea spread across the organization, then you get 100. Because that's the value. Now, we're not just paying you just to, you know, keep your improvements to yourself. We're paying you to come up with ideas that the organization can really use. So once you get buy-in across the organization, then you get 100 on your idea. Now, a little draconian, sure, but the point is, is that, you know, we want these ideas to spread. We want them to get implemented, and we want buy-in. An idea on paper is a useless idea. That has zero value. Only time an idea has value is when it gets implemented. Everything up is just the legwork to get to that point. So the point around collaboration is the more we engage people during the process, the, the much easier it is after we're done getting the implementation done. So you don't get buy-in in the solution phase. You get buy-in on the problem statement phase. If you get to a solution and says, well, you were working on the wrong problem, you have a lot of backtracking to do. So you get, you get buy-in, you get collaboration, you get input, you get feedback all throughout the process. Now, this is also is a tool for pretty much any scope. Again, A3 is not a magic tool. All it is is a way to document your thinking. So your problem statement might be you know, a big corporate problem statement, like we have a $1 million net, net income shortfall. Or it might be that the uh, uh, compression, uh, uh, compression in, our, in, our, in our system is 20% below what target condition is. I mean, it could be technical. It could be business condition. It shouldn't be, just to be clear all the little improvements that you do. So uh, um, uh, Jeff, John Shook talked about suggestion uh, programs this morning. Um, I actually prefer a slightly different word. Lots of organizations have suggestion programs. How many of you have suggestion programs in place? Okay, no, a few. I hate the word suggestion. Look it up in the dictionary. By definition, suggestion is for someone else. That's what a suggestion is for. Here, wouldn't it be nice if, I think you should do your work that way. Oh, I think you'll be more productive that way. Hey, I think you should try this tool. 
It's really easy to go and tell everyone else how to do their work better. It's a lot harder to figure out how I should do my work better. And as John said this morning, that's really what daily lean improvement's about. How do I improve my own work or my team's work? So all those little things, I'm going to move a table around, or I'm going to change the layout of something, you don't need an A3 for that. You know, that just do it. You know, just develop the thinking, look at the problem, have the conversation, and move forward. So an A3 isn't for everything, but it is a flexible tool that can help you with a lot of those things. Now, as we think about that, I just want to get beyond the tool and talk about the thinking that goes into it. Um, and Because the, the thinking is what matters. So I'll kind of talk about the structure of the A3 as we talk about the thinking. So first of all is that the principles or the pr beliefs or the values that you use in the organization matter greatly. Now, here's just, this is just our articulation of what those pr lean principles might look like. Now, I subscribe to the theory that all models are wrong and some are useful. So I would never pr propose that these are the right lean principles. They're useful. They're useful for us. We've tested them many times. They work well. Are they right? No, they're not right. There's a million things missing and a million things you could do better. Uh, but they're useful. So this is our, just our, simply our articulation of it. But the really important thing is understanding why principles matter. So here's our simple formula. Uh, and for the engineers in, room, in the room, forgive me for the non-scientific nature of this formula. But principles drive behaviors. Behaviors drive our actions. And the actions we take determine the results that we get. Now, most change programs start from actions and results. Go do this and get a different result. We begin and end there. But if I want to get sustainable change, if I want 2 a.m. on the shipping docks when there's a problem for someone to do the right thing, the only way I'm going to get that is to get the principles right and the behaviors right. That's the only way. So if I want sustainable lean change, I have to work at the principles and behaviors level. It's the only way to get there. Now, why this matters uh, is, is imagine I have a principle or a belief or a value that says all people are inherently bad. And you're, you carry a principle with you that says all people are inherently good. Now, in the exact same circumstances, will we make vastly different decisions? Absolutely. So if I want my organization to be consistent, let me just ask you this. Why on, on, on Wednesday morning or Thursday morning or next week, why is it a good idea to not tell your entire organization to just go start improving stuff? Why would you not do that? Somebody tell me. You don't have principles for how to do it? What would you get if you did that? Chaos. chaos. You would get chaos. We actually have an organization that did this, an organization I'm invested in, and a pretty good management team, but they made a mistake, and... Their employees were, were pretty engaged, so they, they huddled their employees together and say, we want your ideas. We want to improve quality. We want to improve cost. Give us your ideas. So they'd have all the team leaders go out to all the meetings, and they'd collect all the ideas, and then they'd look at the ideas. Oops, these are the wrong ideas. And in fact, they were. Because if they would have implemented all of those ideas, they would have gone 360 degrees and ended up back where they, want, where they started. Because one said, well, we need another piece of this equipment. And another idea was, well, get rid of that piece of equipment. If they would have followed all of those ideas, they would have moved in hundreds of different directions. If I get the thinking right in the organization, the most important word you need to learn about this is common. Do we have common thinking, common principles, common way of seeing, common way of, of talking? If we get the common principles right, I can send my organization off because I know what direction they're going to head. When they see a problem on the shipping docks at 2 a.m. in the morning, I know how they're going to think and behave around that problem. Now, that just became a much bigger problem than telling people just what actions to take. But if I want sustainable lean change, that's the level I need to work at. So let me talk about some pieces of this, and you can kind of see the four quadrants of the, the A3 up in the corner. Just talk about a few elements of where we get the thinking right and wrong in some of these, uh, some of these quadrants. The problem statement sounds simple enough. We've been developing problem statements since the day we entered the workforce, and often before that, but it sounds pretty simple, right? What's the problem? Well, this is broken. Great, I understand. We'll go fix it. Problem statements shouldn't be that hard, yet we fail at problem statements left, right, and center. Now, just to understand the, the, the impact of problem statements is the problem statement sets your trajectory. So, you know, if you'd send two people off in just five-degree different trajectory, you get a little far off, and you get pretty far apart. 
pretty quickly. So the problem statement that you select, how you word your problem statement, has a huge impact on all the work you do after that. What, what observation you go, what data you go collect, what solutions actually work. Problem statement is absolutely critical. Now, just to give you an idea of, of the different trajectories, um, uh, compare two different problem statements. So here's a problem statement that I get often. Uh, somebody I'm coaching comes to me and says, Joe's a jerk. You get that problem statement? Any of you have that problem statement? Any of you Joe? Oh, sorry, just kidding. Um, so, you know, that's their problem statement. Joe's a jerk. I can't work with him. He's a disaster. He's mean. He's not cooperative. So his problem statement is Joe's a jerk. That's not a very helpful problem statement because the only solution to that is to go change some other person. Now, my wife's been trying that for a long time. Given up, pretty much. Uh, not easy to just go change some other person. Now, we rewrote the problem statement to how can I develop a working relationship with Joe? Now, the conditions in which we're looking at that problem statement is, vastly, is very much the same, but the problem statement is vastly different. In one problem statement, the whole set of solutions rested entirely in Joe's body. Now, how do I develop a working relationship with Joe? Develops a whole new set of possibilities, which includes not only myself, but other people around us as well. That's a vastly different, it's the same problem statement, but it's also a vastly different problem statement. Uh, uh, a common one we get is, well, we don't have enough, pick your equipment, oven capacity. We don't have enough oven capacity. We don't have enough conveyor capacity. We don't have enough assembly capacity. Um, well, that's one way to write the problem statement. Um, we, uh, the other way is that most people write it is, we don't have enough ovens. We don't have enough assembly resources. We don't have enough this or that. Now, if I define I don't have enough ovens versus I don't have enough oven capacity, those, again, very similar problems, but very different problem statements. I don't have enough ovens means, what's the only solution? I don't have enough ovens. <laughs> Buy more ovens. So that's, the, that's why the oven manufacturer will always come and give you that problem statement, right? I don't have enough oven capacity. Uh, opens up a whole other different set of ideas. Where am I wasting that capacity? Where do I have scrap? Where do I have rework? Where do I have downtime? Whole world opens up of different possibilities. So the problem statement that we write down has a huge impact on the trajectory that we take from that point forward. The other thing I'll say about problem statements is that you should always think about writing this in pencil. So again, pencil from a figurative standpoint. Of all the problem statement coaching I've done, at least 50% of the time, as we get into the problem, we rewrite the problem statement. Something we learn in going to understand current reality, something we learn in developing the, the target condition, has us going back and rewriting the problem statement because we were headed down the wrong trajectory. So if you, don't like to be, if you don't like to be wrong, as I mentioned, I'm a recovering engineer, so I don't like to be wrong. Um, if you don't like to be wrong, well, just don't consider you know, rewriting your problem statement you were wrong. Just say, well, I've learned. So you can, you know, you can phrase it that way if it's more comfortable. But rewrite your problem statements. As you learn things, go back to your problem statement and make sure you're still working on the right problem statement. Um, the next is the current reality. So what is the current reality? What's really going on? So the principle we talk about is, is directly observing work. Now, you, you hear this as going to the, you know, go see or go to the Gemba. Now, the point is, just to be really clear about the wording, is it's not really about going to see. It's about going to understand. That's really the objective. It's not to go and see. Lots of people go and see. Some of you went on a plant tour this morning. You went and saw. But there's a big difference between what I call industrial tourism, which is I had a nice tour, but I didn't really learn anything, and observation, which is I've actually studied it and I understand it at some level. So John Chuck talked about Ono Circle. Stand in one spot for three hours and see what you learn. Learn a whole lot by actually observing. Now, it doesn't actually have to be going to the factory floor. Wherever your problem is, you need to go and understand the ground truth reality of what's actually going on. So let me take this to the product development world. Uh, many years ago, uh, there was a, a dental care company that wanted to develop a new child's toothbrush. And thinking like, you know, thinking like a lot of people, oh, just design a new child's toothbrush and put it on the market. Someone said, no, we should actually go and observe customers using the product. Well, a lot of people thought this was nuts. You know, it's brushing your teeth. You brush your teeth every day. How much observation do you really need to understand how, how ch children brush your teeth? Now, 
Some of you, if, if you can remember back this far, uh, the children's toothbrushes of old were pretty much looked just like an adult toothbrush, just smaller. It makes sense, right? It's a kid. You take a toothbrush, you make it smaller. It has smaller hands. Makes a lot of sense. But when they actually say, let's go and observe what's actually happening in the marketplace. What they found out is that kids don't brush their teeth like adults. They grab the toothbrush with their fist. And they go like this, hitting themselves in the mouth. Now, what happens is when they actually see how the customer was actually using the product, taking an adult toothbrush and making it smaller just made it harder for them to use. So what did they do? They designed a big, fat handle. So pretty much any child's toothbrush you see in the market today has a big, fat handle that's bigger than your tooth toothbrush handle. Why? Because they put their assumptions aside. They went to the ground truth. They went to the gamma. They went to observe what was actually going on. And that's what this is all about. Putting the assumptions aside, going to understand it as if we're learning for the first time. So most organizations fail at this a lot. And, and I can tell you, um, I could ask you how long you've stood in one spot uh, in the last month or in the last year. Um, but again, just going to the shop floor is not enough about to do observation. It takes a lot more than that. So it's not just walking through, it's actually going to do the observation itself. Now, target condition. This is something that we have to put a lot more, lot more thinking in than, than, uh, than we tend to think about. We like to say, well, the target condition is just removal of the bad thing that we had before. Something was broken, it's now fixed. That's not our target condition. So our target condition is really developing a new future, something that really takes us from where we are so we need to understand our current reality first. We need to find the ideal state for where we're really trying to go. What is that target? If we actually did all the things that we'd like to do, what would it look like then? And once we have those two points, again, being the engineer, two points make a line, that determines our vector. Once we understand where we want to be, that determines the direction that we need to get to go. So we need to spend time developing that target condition. What does good look like? So you can think about the question in that simple terms. We can get more complicated and fancy with the lingo if you want. But simply, what would good look like? It should be beyond just the absence of the problem you're currently working on. That's not, that's not continuous improvement. That's just firefighting. Removing the symptom is just firefighting. Taking what you see in that problem and moving it to a new target condition, that's continuous improvement. So we need to define what that target condition is. Once we understand where we are and where we, where we want to be, now we understand what direction to go. Now, as we go through that process, this really takes us into plan, do, check, act. You heard a little bit of this from John again. And I just want to talk about this. So how many of you have heard of plan, do, check, act? How many of you use it well every day? <laughs> okay. That went down quite a bit, didn't it? This has been around for 90 years, right? This has been around for a long time, but we don't use it right because we don't think about it in terms of our own work. So. Let me just take you again back to people development, the coaching conversation. So you want to be coaching people. The A3 becomes a great tool for helping that coaching conversation. Now, we ask other people to apply standard work. If I'm going to coach somebody, shouldn't I have standard work too? Now, here's just a simple version of that standard work. But that A3 is at least defining the problem. You know, what's, you know, what is the problem? What's the current condition? What's the target condition? Let's coach someone through that. And let's develop the action. What's going to happen out of that? Who's going to do what by when? And then let's actually go see what result we get, because that's where we learn. Now, we'll be very clear when we say coaching, because most organizations do what we call coaching towards the solution. Someone comes to me with a problem, and I try to help them get the right answer. Now, it's really important that all of us have the right answer. How many of you have the right answer? OK, it's good. Put your hand up whether you know what the problem is or not, right? Because we have the right answer. So I want to coach them towards the right answer. That's coaching towards the solution. But that's not, that's not enough. That does not develop people. That gets the right answer, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't develop uh, the people. Developing the people is coaching towards the method, which is how do I go about understanding current condition, understanding the, 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 the current reality, understanding the problem statement. That's coaching towards the method. So there's a big difference between coaching the solution and coaching the method. A good lean organization will spend most of their resources on coaching towards the method. Now, coaching on the method is slower. It takes more time. It's a bigger investment. And there are times when you should not be coaching the, 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 the method. 
For example, if you're in a burning building and someone comes up to you and says, how do I get out? You don't want to start going, well, what data would you gather and how would you understand that problem? And, you know, no, you point them the direction on the way out. So coaching becomes a very powerful mechanism to leverage the A3. Now, just a little bit of call to action and then we'll, uh, we'll have a little time for some questions. Um, first, and this is perhaps most important, as I said earlier, one of the most important in indicators for lean is leaders applying lean to their own work. So before you walk out of here thinking, how do I get my organization to do A3s well? I'd suggest starting figuring out how you're going to use A3s well. That's a much easier problem to solve, and you really can't solve the other one. How do I get everyone else to do it until I solve this one? How do I do it? Not only will you be more credible, but you'll be a much more effective coach. Because you're going to have hang-ups, you're going to have problems, and all the things you have, other people are going to have as well. As you fight through them, as you struggle through them, it'll teach you a lot about how to coach other people. So you can even start this week. As I mentioned, if you walk out of this conference with no actions to take, it was a waste. Take action. Well, start with an A3. Oh, take, take something you learned this week. Take some idea that you heard. Take something you saw at one of the, the, the conferences or at one of the tours. And just start developing an A3 for how you're going to communicate that solution to a specific problem statement. Again, start with a problem statement. Um, to the rest of your team when you go back. Obviously, your organization sent you here hopefully to bring back a few ideas and share them, not just to keep them all to yourself. So try it. You know, take an A3 out, use it to, to uh, write out an A3 for how to communicate that idea that you want to share with people back to your own organization. Now, the point is, is I don't believe in organizational change. I believe there's no such thing. I believe organizations do not change. But organizations are made up of what? People. The people in organizations change, and they change one at a time. So this is a constant process of developing our people one person at a time. Now, we want to figure out how to leverage that up and get more people on faster. But in the day, each person has to go through and develop that thinking. And it's really hard to do that unless we develop it for ourselves. Okay, so uh, that pretty much wraps up my prepared comments, and we'll uh, have some time for questions. Are there any uh, extra sheets that we passed out? We were short four up here. Okay. So I, can, I should mention the, the sheet we handed out. This is, uh, I believe, in, in making waste things waste-free. So we developed a tool called Single Point Lessons, which uh, conveys lean ideas in one page. So uh, thinking that we're talking about this topic today, I thought you might be helped by just a little aid to help you walk through the A3 process. It's not an educational tool. It's simply a communication tool. So uh, hopefully it's it, uh, something that you can provide that's useful for you. And if you, we don't have enough copies, I can get one to you later. Questions? I'm just going to pass around the mic, so whoever has a question, just raise your hand, please. I remember there's another session after this, so it's not straight from here to the boat ride, so no advantage to getting out super early. What do you, what do you call suggestion programs, if you don't like the word suggestion? Um, I, I think... Uh, uh, my preference is an a idea program. You know, and, and I think most organizations develop whatever works for them. So let me say that first. Whatever works for you, use it. You know, I don't have a huge hang-up over the language, but I think it's about ideas. So ideas you take to your team, your manager, your, your, your immediate supervisor. You go about working on that idea and implementing the idea. Uh, suggestions are things you type into a computer. It goes to some committee that meets once a month if it doesn't get preempted by some other meeting. They review it, eventually assign it to some engineer, and then it may or may not get done. So it's really about implementing ideas. So that's the word I like to use. But in the end, use what, idea, what word works for you. A question. On the A3, in, in the real world, do, do you find that uh, a group of people may start an A3 and it transition to another group that it really isn't the person perhaps that started it that takes it to completion? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm coaching a team through a, an A3, and it started off as a problem of they, they took part of the manufacturing organization and split them up into shift people and manufacturing or uh, equipment people. So their problem statement was how to optimize those two groups of people. Um, to make sure they weren't doing redundant work, make sure they actually had all their bases covered. That was the original problem statement. 
Now, as they went through and developed a solution for that, they got to basically what I call control point standardization or basically sort of leader standard work for who's going to do what every day, who's going to do what every week, and what things are we paying attention to the organization. As that happened, to do that effectively, they needed every manager in the entire organization to develop that. So they wrapped up one A3 and started a new one with a new leader, a new owner, a new team, and so on. Because to finish the first one, they really had to take the next logical step. And so I think that happens uh, more often than it doesn't happen. And if you're a true learning organization, uh, you'll finish each A3 with a lot more ideas than you have resources to go work on. We, uh, we utilize, uh, uh, as far as an uh, idea program, we call it the big idea. Uh, we'll pay uh, as much as 10% uh, of the savings. We've had some projects that developed uh, savings over 200000 We cap it at two, 2000 And we'll pay uh, 50 bucks for any kind of idea that comes in. I can see where A3 would uh, do a better job with our program because it would go through the steps. But it's an hourly employee or, or a member of uh, a non-exempt group that... Uh, can turn an idea, but he has to implement it. That's the difference between a suggestion program and this. And if he has a problem implementing them, this is where A3 would tie together because with his supervisor and his idea of the problem, they could format that thing and come in with probably a better application. Absolutely. And the, the other thing we do is the supervisor getting involved has to pay for this idea out of his cost center. So if he thinks that the reward is not there or that he's not going to get some kind of return on investment, then he's got to think twice about, do I implement this thing? We eat the ones that uh, really have no economic value, but they're savings of something. And we do that just so we can install pe instill in people that there are ideas out there. You might pay a bunch of 50 bucks or 25 bucks for something, but eventually you hit the 200,000, yep. and it works well. Very good. And, and it brings up you know, an important point around... You know, the, the role of the supervisor in making sure we're implementing good ideas. And I don't care if it's supervisor, plant manager, CEO, board of directors. We have responsibility for making sure we're implementing, working on the right problems and implementing the right solutions. So you, probably a lot of you have heard the phrase creativity before capital. So we have a role for coaching through the process, not just at the end of approving, uh, approving the solution, but through the process. So we had a, we had a team that was working on a problem, and uh, the problem was... They had a, a, a needles that came out of a machine over here, and they needed to go into a, a plunger or a, a plastic insert that was on the factory side over there. And they were con truck, fork trucks going back and forth carrying all this material. So solution one was move all the equipment together. Well, this is stuff that's rooted to the ground with the anti-vibration, and it was you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to move all this equipment back together. So they said, well, let's build a conveyor. Well, okay, that's better. But that's just automating the waste, and it's, it's $50,000. So then they came up and said, well, let's, let's look at it again. How do we get this from over here to over there? So one of them said, well, I went to the bank. I didn't get out of my car, and I was able to deposit my check. Well, how did I do that? Well, little pneumatic tube. You stick the thing in, and it sucks it up. So that's exactly what they implemented. They just put up a little pneumatic tube right over the ejector port of the, 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 the needles. They... You know, flying through the air uh, over your head in this little pl plastic pipe and drop right into the tool where, they, where the, uh, the plastic parts are coming, uh, coming out. Now, if you're afraid of needles, seeing them all flying over your head is kind of scary. But, but the point is, is that it wasn't, the problem was right and their thinking was right, but you have to get the creativity. And having a supervisor pay for it is an awfully good restriction, right? Because I, I better think twice, am I really using my resources wisely? Very good, thank you. A uh, quick question uh, related to the A3 approach uh, uh, management. One of the things that uh, we are struggling uh, uh, to well define uh, the use of this uh, A3 thinking approach is that uh, should we use it uh, for a major project like a project management approach or should we use it uh, on the kind of uh, top priority issue of a specific, uh, let's say, a production cell? What is your experience on that one? Well, I think fundamentally A3 is just a way to structure the thinking. So I like to see when an organization really takes all, we say, well, we're going to start in the strategic projects using A3s. And so they start using it, and then you just start seeing people, you know, they have a problem, and they start writing an A3. You know, they, they don't think anything of it. A3 is just the tool they use to structure their thinking. So they're, they're figuring out how to run their team meetings better, and they're writing an A3 for that. 
and they're using it to go uh, uh, work on a problem uh, with their team, and they start writing an A3 with that. Point is, is that all it is is a way to structure your tool, so it shouldn't necessarily be limited to one thing or the next. Now, I will say this, is it's a learning tool. Again, it's not just around the document. It's not about, there's nothing magical about completing an A3. All it is is a mechanism to make the thinking visible, allow for learning, and allow for coaching. So my real answer to your question is, start using it in the place which is going to create the most learning the most rapidly. So if it's projects that the senior staff needs to be working on anyway, great. They need to work on it anyway. They can't defer it till later, and so we're going to have them bring it out. If it's something that's going to take 18 months till we actually get to go through the whole cycle, really hard to learn rapidly in 18 months. So where to get started with somebody is, I'd say, get started in a place that forces people into the habit of using it and gets learning happen rapidly.